everyone. Um, I, I am uh, extremely pleased to be chairing this discussion of uh, this excellent new monograph by Heather Williams and her co-author, um, Alexi Drew, uh, discussing this issue of, um, well, not just Twitter, um, but how we can engage in nuclear diplomacy in an era of social uh, media disinformation and just generally the chaos that seems to be surrounding us. Um, we, of course, began this session internally by me not understanding how Zoom was going to work. So I think that's probably a pretty good uh, indication of the challenges uh, as old people try to handle uh, technology. Uh, you know, we live in this era um, in, in which uh, information is changing really, really dramatically. And so I'm extremely pleased um, that Heather's here uh, to talk to us um, about her monograph and particularly to really begin to grapple with these, these questions. Because I think one of the interesting things about this era has been that as soon as President Trump began tweeting, people kind of recoiled like, yeah, but it's not real. You know, nothing, nothing could go wrong. I mean, this isn't real speech, right? Everybody knows it's not real. And, and I think what we've seen, and, and the monograph wonderfully illustrates, um, is that these are real presidential utterances and that this is part of a change in how we communicate and that change will necessarily impact um, crisis stability. Um, I don't need to do much, I think, to introduce Heather. Uh, in particular, you're already, you're already here, uh, but Dr. Heather Williams is a lecturer in the Defense Studies Department and the Center for Social Science and Security Studies. Um, in addition to Heather, we have uh, Vipin Narang. Uh, Vipin is a professor at MIT uh, and uh, is also uh, one of the people, I think, who was pretty quick to realize, I don't know if you can hear the screaming children, um, one of the people who was apparently something's very unfair in my household this morning. Uh, Nibin is also one of the people who really has, I think, been quick to understand that this is a new era that brings new security challenges. Uh, so uh, each of them are going to speak for seven or eight minutes, uh, and then we're going to open this up uh, to questions. Um, this is being recorded. Um, you can't jump in, but you can ask a question in the, the Q&A box. Uh, and I will curate those uh, and try to make sure that we have a lively conversation. Uh, and so with that, Heather. Great, thanks. Um, thanks so much, Jeffrey, for the intro and for doing this. And also thanks to Vipin. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, at the outset, I also wanna thank everyone who's kind of provided feedback on the report so far. I can see some of you on this call. Um, I think that Alexi and I, a lot of our thinking, it, it seems to have hit a chord. Um, I hope that one of the biggest things that comes through with the report is that it opens up new lines of inquiry because above all, I think it's highlighting that we need to do a lot more thinking around these issues having to do with social media and international security more broadly. So what I'm just going to really briefly talk about is I'll say a little bit about the report's main findings in case you haven't had a chance to read the whole thing yet. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to say a few words about the Twitter hack that it was a total coincidence happened on the same day that the report was released. Um, and then some of the recommendations, but the bottom line up front, if you could summarize it in a tweet, it would be that uh, decision makers in particular should tweet with caution um, during crises. They should just stop tweeting. Um, the risks of tweeting during crises are just too great when we really don't understand how those messages are gonna be understood. Um, so with the report, um, uh, just to kind of highlight some of our, uh, our points and findings, Twitter has just become an unavoidable part of public diplomacy. Uh, to be clear, this isn't just about Trump. We often talk about Trump, but a lot of other international leaders are using Twitter. Some of them are mimicking Trump now, which is a bit concerning. Um, but because of the increasing use of Twitter, what Alexi and I wanted to consider was how social media might impact on crisis escalation, uh, particularly involving nuclear actors. Uh, there were two overarching themes that we pulled out uh, that I think are worthy of consideration. Um, the first theme was is um, asymmetric tweeting, right? Um, the United States uses Twitter a lot more than most other countries. Russia prefers their own national platforms, um, such as Contact, uh, and Twitter is banned in China. So the U.S. is really the main consumer of, uh, of tweets. 
it, with that in mind, Twitter offers an ideal platform for malicious activity that targets Americans. This includes disinformation campaigns or Bitcoin scams, as we saw. The second main theme is that Twitter itself isn't escalatory or de-escalatory. Rather, whether or not um, you know, tweets lead to escalation, it really depends on the bigger political context and specifically who's involved. Um, as much as I greatly enjoyed Jeffrey's book, The 2020 Commission Report, I don't necessarily think that a single tweet uh, could start a nuclear war. Rather, it's because of all the other dynamics and the history um, and the political context at the time in which that tweet was sent. And I actually think that that does come through really clearly in Jeffrey's book. It sometimes gets missed when people talk about it though. So in that sense, Twitter is just the latest means of diplomatic communication. Uh, what makes it unique, however, is its speed. You know, if you have a thought, you can tweet it right, right away. It's relatively informal. Uh, a, quite a few government tweets or tweets from government officials, as we know, they aren't going through some filter. Right? They aren't being screened for security clearances or to make sure that they align with other government policies. And then the other thing that makes it unique is just how open it is, right? Um, anyone can follow anyone else and you can see what they're thinking. Uh, in terms of escalation though, all of these traits can really work both ways. It could have escalatory effects, it could be de-escalatory. So just to emphasize, Twitter itself isn't necessarily bad. Um, it's how Twitter gets used. Um, with regards to the Twitter hack, um, so we released this report at 3 p.m. London time on Wednesday, July 15th. Six hours later, Twitter experienced the biggest hack in its history. Um, I hadn't looked at my phone for a few hours and then I came back and saw that and it was pretty shocking. But what this hack was, um, it was a Bitcoin scam that raised approximately $118,000 before it was shut down. It targeted high profile people like Elon Musk and Joe Biden. And the way that it happened is that a group of hackers uh, actually worked with a Twitter employee who had access and could take over individuals' accounts. And so they gave that Twitter employee the tweet and the employee just pushed out um, this Bitcoin scam. How does, that scam, how does that hack interact with a lot of what our findings were? Um, it obviously raises really significant concerns. What if, the, what if it hadn't been a Bitcoin scam that was the tweet? What if it was something much more dangerous? What if they had taken over um, US Stratcom's Twitter account and tweeted that a nuclear missile was incoming to Hawaii? This is not far-fetched if we look at the history of this sort of um, activity. What if it had been a tweet that the US was in the process of launching a conventional strike on Iran? That also might not be far-fetched um, if you think of some of the president's tweets. Um, so this isn't gonna be the last Twitter hack and we really have to start being prepared for these types of disinformation campaigns and fake tweets and treating them with a bigger degree of scrutiny and having some resilience, particularly for Americans because of that asymmetry. The other thing that the hack flagged is that Twitter's response was really concerning. Um, their response was to take down approximately 300,000 verified accounts. During a crisis, this would just be deeply problematic. Um, crises are when people turn to social media, media even more. Um, they use it for information purposes. They use it for reassurance to know where to go to get aid if need be. Um, but when Twitter took down those 300 blue tick accounts, one of them that they shut down was the National Weather Service. So the National Weather Service couldn't notify people in Illinois about an incoming tornado. At least they couldn't notify them via Twitter. Um, but you know, what if they had taken down verified accounts during a real, like a geopolitical crisis um, when people were relying on official channels and accounts for information? This could just create carnage. So to um, kind of wrap up with some food for thought, hopefully, on what are our recommendations? Um, some of these are in the report. Some of them we've also kind of thought about since that hack. Um, the recommendations for Twitter are really that Twitter hopefully will share some information about the hack and how it happened. Uh, there's an obvious risk here, which is if you share too much about how the hack happened, you might have a copycat or you might be giving away something sensitive. But it's also just really important um, for, um, you know, like prevent, for, for future prevention. Um, but also Twitter actually has some pretty good policies on dealing with a lot of these things. This hack didn't happen because of lack of policies. 
um, it wasn't even a technical intrusion, rather it was someone within Twitter itself. So Twitter as a company also obviously has to consider who has access to people's accounts and can just do a takeover like this. And I would guess that they are doing that. Our recommendations for the Department of Defense. So um, something that might not have gotten noticed in the report, this was actually a DOD sponsored study, um, which uh, was a bit interesting that they sponsored a study in which we kind of openly criticized the president. But um, our recommendations for DOD in particular were for the US government to develop interagency best practices because what we found is that a lot of times US government officials were tweeting at cross purposes. So during the US Iran crisis earlier this year, Trump and Pompeo were literally tweeting the opposite thing. Um, again, during crises, this could be really concerning. So there needs to be some sort of interagency process and coordination. And then final recommendation brings us back to where I started. It's really for all government officials, just stop tweeting during crises. Um, it just runs too big of a risk of sending mixed messages and creating confusion. I think that government agencies can use Twitter to disseminate, you know, speeches or essential information or pre-approved and pre-coordinated policies. That would be really useful during crises. Um, but having an individual, a high profile individual tweet fire and fury in the middle of a crisis that contradicts other government um, statements is just really problematic. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Vipin. And again, just thanks everyone for joining. Really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, it's good to be here. Um, I commend the report to anybody, so you should read it in full. Uh, and I'll say a couple of words uh, about the report and then um, some other observations for food for thought so we can just have a discussion. Um, what I really like about the report is uh, it, does, it, it, it makes the really important observation uh, that Twitter itself is uh, an agnostic platform. And so it uh, doesn't have a uniform effect uh, when it comes to uh, crisis dynamics or implications. Uh, one of the advantages of Twitter as a platform is that it does allow rapid and direct communication uh, from leaders to either other leaders or to the public. And that doesn't necessarily have to have a destabilizing effect. That can have a stabilizing effect, right? So it can, it can be used to reassure. It can be used uh, to communicate information that helps de-escalate crises. It helps uh, you know, uh, to be able to disseminate uh, correct information uh, from uh, a, a known prominent verified account. So if the, president, uh, if the president in theory tweets something about how uh, reports uh, of an incoming missile strike into Hawaii or false and everyone can calm down, it can be very useful uh, and can be uh, uh, an effective tool uh, to disseminate uh, and correct misinformation uh, as well as propagate misinformation. Uh, on the other hand, it can also, uh, uh, it can also be very difficult uh, as a platform because there's so much noise surrounding these signals. So the signal to noise ratio uh, can be uh, very difficult to disaggregate. So even in a democracy, for example, you may get very clear tweets from officials in the midst of a crisis, but one may be reassuring and one may not be. And as a user in the public domain, then you have contradictory information from two otherwise uh, uh, official accounts, uh, and that can create more noise than, than it solves. And so the, the lack of coordination, for example, on Twitter amongst governments itself uh, can lead uh, uh, to interesting dynamics. So if you're Kim Jong-un and you see President Trump say or tweet, uh, you know, the, the threat from North Korea is over, but then John Bolton at the same time tweets, uh, if you're a national security advisor still, uh, you know, negotiating with Kim Jong-un is a dead end and they're never going to give up their nuclear weapons, right? There's, you can get contradictory signals from, from a government. And uh, we normally think that uh, you know, the president makes policy, but we also know that with this president, that's not always the case. And so it can be very difficult to separate signal from noise, uh, even on a platform like Twitter. The, uh, other, uh, the other point that the, um, the, the report raises, and I think is a good avenue for future research, and this is not a plug, Heather and I are writing a chapter uh, on this very topic for an edited volume uh, that Scott Sagan and I are doing, uh, Fragile Balance of, uh, of Terror, and Jeffrey is also uh, uh, has a chapter in the volume. Um, and we look at, uh, you know, how uh, Twitter as a platform, which is an open platform, 
uh, can very quickly propagate misinformation in the midst of a crisis that puts pressure on governments to escalate. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, on the one hand, in long crises, as uh, information tends to trend toward the mean, uh, you know, Twitter may actually have advantages over other types of platforms that are more closed, like chat platforms, like WhatsApp or, uh, or Signal. Uh, and uh, the, um, but in short crises, discrete crises, as we call it, the, the misinformation can really lead to uh, significant escalatory uh, uh, pressures. And so we take the um, 2019 India-Pakistan crisis uh, over Palama and Balakot as an example. Uh, Twitter was instrumental in the crisis in both good ways and bad ways. Uh, it was... Uh, the Pakistani Director General Ghaffour, who first alerted the world uh, to India's retaliation at the Balakot structure, um, when he announced that there was Indian activity, uh, you know, in near Balakot, and then uh, India then later announced that it had struck this structure. Uh, on the other hand, there was a, a narrative in the amongst the Indian public and the government the, that India had hit the structure and killed hundreds of terrorists. But then Twitter, as essentially an open source intelligence tool, uh, cast doubt on the Indian government's narrative that it actually hit the structure, and then later that it had struck a Pakistani Air Force uh, F-16. And the problem was that the Modi government used those narratives to try to de-escalate the crisis. And here, Twitter as a tool in the open source uh, analysis uh, uh, community was casting doubt on a convenient fiction that the government of India was trying to sustain in order to de-escalate the crisis. So in, in some ways, Twitter, even in long crises, uh, provides a platform uh, that can generate escalatory pressures. And it's possible if uh, you know, the, the, the government of India didn't continue with the narrative that it hit uh, the Balakot structure, and I don't know if it did or not, um, and the F-16, it was able to walk down uh, partly because of uh, a reason the, the report highlights, which is uh, the English Twitter world is very different from uh, the Hindi language uh, medium and, and, and Twitter world. And so it wasn't clear that a lot of the analysis that cast doubt on the government of India's uh, uh, self-proclaimed successes was infecting the Hindi speaking medium, which is where the BJP support uh, was at the time. Uh, so. It, it cuts in both ways. It, there's also a, an interesting comparison between the open platform Twitter and then the private chats that were flying around WhatsApp, which were much more aggressive and very and, and much more difficult to monitor. So one advantage Twitter has at least is that over time you do get this trend towards the mean where misinformation can get corrected. And it's an open platform. So you tend to see, even if you select into your followers, uh, you tend to at least see what the uh, corrections are, are being attempted uh, to be made. But in closed WhatsApp groups, all you're getting is your information bubble that you select into. Uh, and that can lead to, um, uh, you, know, to try, you know, spinning up of hypernationalism and pressure on governments uh, to, to escalate crises. Uh, the final point I will make about the, um, uh, the Twitter hack uh, which is concerning. And I, I agree with uh, uh, everything Heather said. Uh, it's very concerning uh, to have, um, uh, you know, an, uh, uh, an insider attack, an insider-led uh, breach of Twitter that affected um, verified accounts, officials we rely on for information. And you can think of the counterfactual if they weren't interested in Bitcoin and an actor, a malicious actor wanted to start a war, uh, it, was, it was ready to do that. My one point is that we, um, you know, relying on Twitter in times of crises can be dangerous because you can imagine a state actor is sitting on vulnerabilities to affect a breach or a hack at the very moment that would be worst for uh, a crisis. And you can imagine uh, a third party that wants to, you know, have some catalytic effects uh, and, and start a, a conflict or a crisis between two major actors. Or you can imagine uh, an adversary who uh, decides uh, to create confusion uh, in a crisis uh, by exploiting known vulnerabilities either in the Twitter platform or using insiders to generate chaos and uncertainty. So the increasing, so Twitter is here to stay. 
there's no question that this is a, a, a reality that we have to contend with in, in both peacetime and in crises. Uh, but the reliance on Twitter, uh, especially to disseminate or look to official dumb for uh, accurate information in a crisis uh, is particularly dangerous because uh, as the latest hack suggested, uh, you know, Twitter is not necessarily an entirely secure platform. Uh, and states may be able to, in the worst possible moment, uh, generate chaos or, uh, you know, confusion uh, by shutting Twitter down, taking over accounts, uh, or otherwise maliciously acting. And so um, this is the new world we have, to, we have to deal with. It's neither good nor bad, uh, it's reality. Uh, maybe digital reality, but it, or some form of parallel reality, but it is a reality we have to contend with. Uh, <laughs> Who knows so, what reality is today? <laughs> exactly. So uh, I'll stop there. I, I recommend everybody read the, the report. Uh, it has a lot of great nuggets and gems in there. Uh, and we look forward to your questions. Hey, uh, one question that came up, Vipin, in the, uh, we, we have a few questions starting to come in. Um, one, one person would like you to expand just a bit on what you mean by an agnostic platform in this context. And then yeah. I'm going to abuse my position and ask uh, both of you a question. So agnostic was a word that came out and when it came out, I wanted to grab it back. I mean, obviously Twitter has algorithms that make it, make it a, a, a strategic actor in what you see, what you interact with. They are clearly, you know, uh, you know, they they are their their AI uh, is 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 very very sophisticated, and it's agnostic in 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 one sense, in the sense that it is giving you it is giving the user what it thinks the user wants to see, and it's not. I don't know that it's human driven or uh, AI driven, but uh, it's not. Um, it, it is obviously a strategic actor that you interact with uh, as a user. But it, when I said agnostic, what I really meant was uh, it doesn't have necessarily net positive or net negative effects. It has both. Uh, and in some cases, it can be a stabilizing force, particularly in a, in, in a time of crisis. Uh, at the same time, it can be uh, destabilizing. So we, we view Twitter as, uh, as uniformly destabilizing. And I think uh, in and of itself, it can be a platform that can also be stabilizing too. And I think that's that's more of what I wanted to, to say because I, I really don't think any of these platforms are ag agnostic in the, in the true sense of the word. Okay, so my selfish question that uh, I want to direct to both of you, but, but starting with Heather is, when I, when I heard about the Biden hack, I was struck at the lack of imagination. <laughs> you know, if I had someone inside Twitter, uh, you know, if I were Dr. Evil, yeah. I, I could think of so many other ways to profit from this than a Bitcoin scam. Uh, and so I wondered uh, if either of you um, had the opportunity or, or to think about if you had had this access and you were going to engage in some malicious activity, either for, for personal or political gain, uh, you know, how would you have used it? And since I just put you on the spot, I'm going to give you another second to think. Um, I, I know I knew immediately what I would have done, uh, which is rather than rather than Bitcoin this right. Why one one thing we have seen often alleged is that certain governments um, profit if they know that they're going to do some destabilizing activity. So uh, if North Korea is going to do a missile test, they know that's going to have a particular impact on the markets. And so there is some thinking that money moves around in advance of North Korean provocative acts, which is them protecting their assets and seeking to profit from that. Um, and there's even some thought that you could even predict missile tests if you really looked at the markets very closely. So, you know, I, I could certainly imagine, um, you know, buying lots of shares of oil uh, and then having President Trump say something. <laughs> you know, horrifically uh, dangerous that would cause the price of oil to spike up, then of course I'd dump all of that uh, and, and just pocket the money. But uh, <laughs> if you were Dr. Evil, Dr. Williams, <laughs> what would you do? So first off, I'm slightly disturbed by how much thought you've given to this, Jeffrey, and the <laughs> elaborate scenario that you've I'm not surprised with. though. I'm, uh, well, I'm disturbed, not surprised. Um, so off the top of my head, I've got a personal one and then a more political one. I'll start with the political one, um, just because, I mean, as you both know, and a lot of others do, most of my work is actually on arms control issues. And 
just the amount of attention that I've been spending recently on I'm trying to move the needle a little bit on new start extension. Like that's the thing. I wouldn't go for some massive policy change, but for something that the president might not care about enough that if there was some activity about it on Twitter, he'd be like, okay, whatever. So if I could hack in, I would go to DOD, state, NNSA, the president's personal account, Mike Pompeo's and a few others and say, delighted to announce that we are, that we We'll be extending New Star, and we look forward to the Russians' cooperation on this. Like just some sort of hand tying activity, if you know what I mean. Um, on the personal gain side, I I probably would have done some similar scam, but told them to pay the money into like you know my student loan account or something like that. I wouldn't just. I, but, I mean, but you're raising this is the thing. Like you're raising a really important question, which is. The, that tweet, those tweets reminded me of those emails that we all occasionally get from people saying, hi, I know I've never met you, but can you please wire $50,000 into this bank account? And most of us see that and are like, okay, this is a scam, but they still raised $118,000. So clearly this resonated with some people who did buy into it, which in my mind raises a much bigger question, which is, um, it's kind of like, I don't know what to call it, but social media IQ and just being able to tell fact from deep fakes from you know the technical term bullshit uh, like bullshit um you know information that some that people just have different experiences of interacting with social media and might not have the same sort of savvy that those of us do who are on twitter most of the day yeah i mean the it, what's interesting is so they had an insider I wonder whether the the access to the insider depended on what the, the insider was asked to do. So I imagine anything more malicious might have had some difficulty uh, getting insider help. On the other hand, the number of contractors and, and Twitter employees who seem to have access was, seem, I think, a thousand or approximately a thousand. Um, so maybe, you know, especially contractors having access to administrative tools is kind of disturbing. But, um, you know, I, I, the the uh it, it, it's it's concerning um and i get we're lucky that it was so obvious i mean if they really wanted to create chaos they could have released you know started tweeting dms you know if they had access to those dms of the prominent people right i mean there are there are a lot of who knows what's sitting on trump's dms or biden's dms and who's uh, or uh, even lesser, you know, uh, by more, less prominent officials, right? So there's embarrassment, but there's also national security implications, right? And once those are out there, you can't get them back, right? So at least with this hack, you could scrub the, you could scrub the universe of the Bitcoin, you know, tweet, and it would, and we can go on with our lives. But some information, if released, is irreversible. Uh, and forget starting a war there could have been some very, very serious electoral consequences, national security uh, uh, implications, uh, treason, you know? I mean, I think there, were, there was a lot of damage that they could have done. I probably would have been tempted on the, the latter, get some DMs, and, but I mean, that it, could be, it could be very, very, very malicious if they had access yeah, well, to them. One thing, I, one thing that I, I found interesting about that entire process was that it was done so publicly uh, and so there was an incentive for the Biden campaign and others to scream that they had been hacked. I wonder, though, if, if someone had used the president's DMs to solicit donations, the revelation of that would have been so embarrassing to them, the campaign may not have ever wanted to admit it. Right. Right. They may have simply just allowed that money to go out. Um, clearly, you could tell I spend a lot of time imagining how I would take advantage of this. We have a, a question. Um, from Emily Enright, uh, which raises, well, it's a question which raises a question. Um, she wants uh, your collective impact, uh, questions on the impact of tweeting on escalation, whether it's different if the tweeter is generally viewed as uh, more or less legitimate, um, whether it's, uh, or whether it's sort of another, another kind of figure. So I guess the question here is, um, you know, is this really only a problem with um, big name accounts, or are, or is it possible that by manipulating less important or authoritative actors, uh, you might still get the same kind of outcomes? And Emily can complain if I have uh, if I have 
mangled her quest. I think, I think both are a problem. I mean, I think, you know, if obviously in a, in a crisis, if a president, even President Trump, no matter what one may think of, you know, his Twitter behavior, he is ultimately the president of the United States and he can issue orders that can have uh, significant consequences on global affairs. Uh, and so it is, I think it's, that's important. Um, in a crisis now, do, does it matter what, um, you know, uh, what candidate Biden tweets? Probably not as much because he's not in, in, in charge, except, you know, the you know, critical of policies, et cetera, is important from, as a, as a, uh, from a process side. But in terms of uh, consequences right now, until he's, you know, unless, he, and, unless and until he's president, very little. But there is this issue about like, so lesser accounts. What can lesser accounts do? There is this, in the report, you talk about bots. I mean, misinformation and disinformation is very, very powerful, right? And it is very, very easy to quickly ima to imagine how quickly uh, misinformation, either maliciously or inadvertently planted on Twitter, goes viral. And we've seen it happen, right? And uh, everything happens. One, um, one impact or, or consequence of Twitter is, is, the, is the speed at which things propagate. And it's almost like, you know, we used to think of the Cold War, you have 30 minutes to make a decision whether you're going to launch nuclear weapons or not because of the flight times. The flight times gave you a buffer. You know, in India, Pakistan, it's two minutes. Well, Twitter compresses the buffer to zero, right? And things, you know, if they go viral, misinformation and disinformation can have very, very, very significant consequences. It can be very, and it's harder, it's harder to correct, and we know this, it's harder to correct misinformation uh, once it's out there. Uh, you know, people believe what they first hear. And so there's a first mover advantage in Twitter that, doesn't necessarily exist in more traditional media platforms. So Heather, just, what do you oops. think? Yeah, sorry, I was just gonna jump in. Um, I, I, could, I really like and agree with Vipin's point, particularly about bots. And I just wanna um, plug the work by Kate Starberg and her team at University of Washington, where they put together these really cool kind of tweet maps that look at how information gets retweeted and passed on and looking at specific crises to see whether or not um, you know, like deep fake, how regular deep fakes get retweeted. It's, it's actually really terrifying to some extent. So even if you aren't a high profile person, um, if you are part of a disinformation campaign, you can, you can absolutely have an impact. With that said, I do think um, the, that the tweeter, the identity of the sender, or the tweeter, it does matter. Because as Vipin said, certain people, just by nature of their position, they carry greater authority. Um, to use another example that's been getting a lot of Twitter action lately is the US Stratcom account, right? So um, they had that really horrible um, mess up on New Year's Eve, was it this a, a year yes. ago maybe? You know, just saying like, oh, we're gonna drop something bigger than, a, than the ball on New Year's. Or even some of their more recent tweets about, um, you know, Myth Mondays, where, you know, we looked, uh, we looked really closely at what is Strat, like Stratcom it actually has a very clearly articulated Twitter policy and they do see it as playing a role in deterrence messaging. But if you take it too far, you know, because it's Stratcom that's saying this, that also carries a message with it. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, like we didn't want to take too many shots at, at Stratcom in, in the report um, because after that New Year's Eve incident, it really did seem like they had made some effort to look into how they tweet and trying to get it right. Um, I think that the, the Myth Monday tweets have, have missed the mark on a few occasions though. Yeah, I, just being the resident hippie, I mean, I find it fascinating that Stratcom in general believes that it is effective at nuclear signaling and that it simultaneously maintains this Twitter account that suggests to me that it is not good at messaging. Um, that kind of leads to a question that Shay Cotton asked that, uh, Heather, I, I want to start with you and, and get your, your opinion on. You, you're quite polite in the, the monograph in terms of phrasing recommendations that are best practices and encouragement and guidelines. And um, Shay wants to know whether governments should impose rules requiring certain cybersecurity policies and regulations uh, on content. You know, are, are there legal and regulatory things um, that we should do, uh, you know, so that Twitter doesn't cause a nuclear war. 
Um, so hi, Shay, thank you so much for asking this question. I was really hoping someone would bring this up. So this, I mean, this just kind of gets to the crux of democracy, doesn't it? How do you balance freedom of speech with public safety when it's playing out on a private, not private platform, but um, like, a, you know, a privately owned company that Twitter is providing the platform. And I don't have an easy answer to this one. I think that that's something that, um, that Twitter itself is, I, you, we can see Twitter grappling with this right now, right? So what tweets are considered a public health danger, for example? Um, tweeting, you know, a YouTube video advocating for the use of hydro hydrochloxy hydroxychloroquine, I still can't say it, um, advocating hydroxychloroquine use to combat COVID-19, that is a public health safety risk and that tweet should come down. But something like if you're in the middle of a geopolitical crisis and the president tweets something that could be read multiple ways, that's a much harder kind of decision for Twitter to make. And in general, I'm just kind of skeptical about, um, about government telling Twitter what they can and can't take down. I, I think it's, you know, I think it's a role for Twitter to play in showing good judgment, particularly about public health safety at the moment. But the other actor in this that we haven't talked about much is well, a little bit that we haven't really covered though, is the public itself, us as Twitter users. Like we just have to get kind of better at discerning tweets. And I would say, don't use Twitter as your single news source, for example. You know, if you see something on Twitter, go check it with a government fact sheet, a speech, a more reputable news organization, such as the Washington Post or New York Times. Um, I think that that is the much more kind of practical and safe approach to this rather than telling government to start policing Twitter and um, yeah, and, and saying what, what we can and can't say on the platform itself. Vipin, did you want to say something? There's also a question oh. um, that brings up something you said. Uh, Nasir Hassan says, you know, look, presidents and heads of states, they're going to they're going to use this. Um, and so. Do we just live with that? Yeah, I think we, we have to adjust our um, expectations. And I think the, the hard part uh, is. Um, conditioning ourselves not to overreact to tweets as a as public as the analysts and you know there's a um there's a tendency i think to you know everything is instantaneous and you want instant gratification from the tweets about the tweets um and you know over time i th i i i suspect like every platform there'll be a desensitization process as as the public and as the governments and as analysts get used to it more and the media gets used to it more um, we'll be trained, you know, how to we'll learn lessons from the past, right? In previous crises, you know, maybe, um, you know, uh, responding or overreacting instantaneously uh, was a mistake, and then you course correct. Often we overcorrect. So anyway, the, um, but I don't expect to, you know, this links to the previous question. I don't expect Twitter to regulate content. Why would they? We're the users, we're the product. They have no incentive to regulate content. So, then the question is, should governments regulate content? And that takes you down a slippery slope. I mean, unless you're China and just shut it off entirely, um, then there's a, you know, I, I think this is something we have to live with. And then there, it's incumbent on, uh, you know, if you're an analyst or a journalist sitting on Twitter, I think there is some, we haven't talked about what response, what do we think our responsibilities are, right? I mean, on the one hand, it's Twitter, it's fun. We like cat memes and we like, you know, the, the, there's, a, the, there's a professional personal blur on Twitter. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it's fire and forget. It's 280 characters. You can't often in, include nuance, whether you're a leader or an analyst. And sometimes it can be, you know, they're misinterpreted. They can be misformulated. There can be innocent, you know, innocent typos. And, you, you know, sometimes you say something that is uh, overly hysterical that you don't intend to be. And it's read, you know, in a, in a particular way. And, you know, there... I, I wonder whether there, there's a conversation we had about what does it mean to be a responsible Twitter user in an age of Trump and Modi and everybody else, right? Where, you know, if you're, if you're, if this is our professional job and we tweet professionally as well as personally, right? What is our, what are our obligations and responsibilities uh, to make sure that we aren't part of the problem? I don't have a good answer to that. I've thought a lot about it. I'll, uh, I'll never forget when Twitter initially became a thing. I think it was, um, 
maybe John Duncan, the British diplomat, got a little bit of a reputation by being a kind of lively and informal presence. And I, I recall being sort of shocked that a diplomat was allowed to do this. And uh, someone from the UK told me that at least at that point, they'd had a policy where you could take basically a single training and subsequent to that, you were presumed competent, <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is, you know, sort of a, a decision that I, I hope they've, they've reconsidered. Right. Heather, there's a question um, from Rachel Kelsall. Hang on one second, Jeffrey. Yeah, you want to jump in this? You, I yes. do. I it's, your, wanna... it's your monograph and your meeting. <laughs> you um, jump in anytime you want. You can actually uncohost us and just take over. Well, so I want to ask you and Vipin a question, <laughs> if I can. Um, yeah. To Vipin's last point about thinking about how, like, tweeting responsibly. Um, so both of you have pretty large Twitter followers, right? So Jeffrey, you have like seven. I'm nowhere close 000. to Jeffrey. You, Jeffrey's a Jeffrey's you're about a real thirty thousand cool. behind him, but you know you'll get there. Um, I'm at him like a meager forty five hundred, and I often, I often wonder Vipin in particular because some of the topics that you work on get so politically sensitive. You mean it, like South Asia? Yeah, like South Asia is what I was thinking of. Um, how, like, how do you decide what to tweet and how to tweet and like, what is the discretion that you show? And then Jeffrey, kind of same question to you. You're, you're a little bit more colorful in your tweeting. Um, and so I'm yes. just kind of curious, like what are the, like what are the driving principles that determine how you two tweet? So I've thought a lot about this because um, I think the over the last couple of years in particular, it has gotten really filthy um, and uh, it has made me think twice about things I know are going to just pollute my mentions. Um, but I step back and ask, what is it that my, I believe my role as an academic on Twitter is with, um, you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert. We're all lifelong students, but I study South Asia and nuclear weapons and, and, you know, uh, in maybe reverse order, nuclear weapons, and then with a subspecialty on South Asia. Um, and, you know, the, our, our job is to call it like we see it, I think. And I think if you, if you're an academic um, and, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, you know, better to be lucky than good, but I'm, you know, I'm lucky to be a tenured academic at a, uh, at a good institution that, you know, protects me and supports me. I think our job is to call it like we see it. Um, and Twitter is a good medium to do that. Um, I think there have been, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you, you tweet on the information that's available. Um, and then the question is, is it responsible to tweet at that particular moment? If you know that it, it might be uh, too early, we don't have all the facts. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think there's a happy medium. I think we shouldn't engage in rampant speculation that can create problems. Um, but you, it's certainly plausible, I think, to interpret limited information. This came up recently with, you know, in India, China. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information as to the extent of the, the buildups and the clashes. Uh, and some people believe that it, they, they shouldn't comment because there wasn't enough information. There are some who decided to comment on everything. Uh, and I try to take a middle road, which is, I think it's important to, to, to say what you think at that time based on the information that is available and caveat it uh, accordingly. Um, I think I have probably, uh, I'll stop here. I think the, the one thing I've learned over the past or tried to restrain myself on is being overly provocative. Like there are times I know that the way I phrase things will, in, will, will you know, sometimes you want to throw a grenade and just see what happens. I think I probably cut back a little bit on that. I mean, I just don't need the mentions so filthy and polluted. So, but I'm curious, Jeffrey, because actually Jeffrey is a model for all of us because he, oh, he was no. the first mover on this. No, no, I mean, and what's yeah. what qualifies as responsible tweeting? I don't know. I mean, I think in some ways, I mean, the way I look at tweeting is a legacy of how I looked at blogging in the mid 2000s. Um, and I mean, I vividly remember when I started blogging and I blogged in much the same style as I tweet, which is to say not always very nice or kind. Um, and a lot of people said that it would kill my career. And at the time, I, I remember thinking to myself, and, and I still feel this way, that there just may be some, some career aspirations that I am not suited to. And so it's better for me to be me and succeed in those areas where I'm being me and, and, you know, maybe try to be a little nicer every now and again, but 
at some fundamental level, um, some of the, you know, I, I, I am trying to be truthful about my personality. Um, so that's one, that's one kind of guide that I have. And, and just, just knowing that not everyone is going to like me uh, and that there will be some, uh, some jobs that maybe at least in theory I might've wanted um, that I will not be eligible for because of, of, of the person I am. It's a little bit like when I didn't get a job as a 20 something as a defense contractor because the very conservative person making the decision realized I was living with my girlfriend at the time. <laughs> It's just me. Okay, like, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not going to break up with her for the job, right? So it's, you know, you just, you, you try to be, you try to be truthful to yourself. That's one thing. The second thing though, and this is, I observe this is not how normal people interact with uh, the online world. Um, but I, I swear it is, I, I believe it is good advice. It comes from people who host um, like radio call-in shows. Have you ever noticed that very successful radio call-in hosts are like incredibly abusive of the people who call in and yet people continue to call in and their ratings remain very high and the reality is is that if you have 70,000 people following you and you have you know much larger levels of engagement for individual tweets the vast majority of the people who are listening to what you have to say um, are never going to tweet at you, talk to you, or engage with you. And so the person you're engaging with, you're really, you're really engaging with them for the entertainment of this other third party, this much larger group of people. Um, so I, I have always just felt like, you know, if it, it's like maybe like it's like a hockey game, you know, it's like a, it's a little rough. If you don't, if you don't like it, you can get out of the rink. Um, but the reality is, is that the engagement on Twitter isn't fundamentally for the benefit of the person you're engaging with. That's what drinks and emails and phone calls are for. This is a public forum. And so that other person is really just a prop in the conversation you're having with, with the broader, broader community. And that's, that's true for when I'm engaging with people too. I know that about myself. Um, can also, I take back control and ask Heather a question or no, Vipin, did you want to say? No, I was just going to say, you know, and it's, you know, we're, we're, we're academics and analysts and Twitter isn't peer reviewed, right? So like what we tweet is, you know, essentially, you know, little bits of analysis and the expectation, I think that, you know, um, people are like, oh, I can't believe you're an academic and you're, 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 you're tweeting this stuff. Like you should stick to published, you know, stick to peer review work. I think it's a different world. Right. And I think it's, you can hive those off and they can be separate enterprises. Um, and I think there's value in what we all do in Twitter and there's a happy medium, right? We don't always need to be throwing grenades and intentionally being trollish, et cetera. Uh, but you know, there is, it, it is the expectations that it's going to be like always right, always perfect. I, like, you know, an IS article or something like that's not what Twitter is and academics on Twitter. Oh, oh do you think yeah. IS articles are always right oh, and wow. always perfect? <laughs> Heather, I wanted to, um, I, I want to get you a consulting job here. So I want to ask Rachel Kelsall's question. She's a marketing consultant and nice. she wants to know what you think the report means for companies looking to lobby politicians in terms of guiding their social media and PR campaigns. And I will note that the first three minutes of this answer are probably free, but after that you should set a rate. So Jeffrey, help me, can you help me, an hour. can you help me clarify this question? Do you think that it is specifically interested in how social media companies lobby government? Or like, No, like who, I think it like is, who is it how companies I think this is I think this is this is just companies in general. And and I think this is a question of you have you have you have some fundamental insights about Twitter. Um, and and social media in general, which you have you have gained from looking at how international politics kind of plays out. And, and I think this person, if I, if I understand correctly, and, and she can pop up in the question again if she wants, I think this person wonders if there are broader insights for uh, people dealing with government um, in terms of, of how they go about, uh, about how they go about this. So, you know, uh, you know, I'm imagining, uh, ah, well, um, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm imagining do we did we in the course of your research you know did you learn how for example stratcom thinks about social media 
Okay. And if somebody is engaging with government as either a, a business lobbying them or just uh, just a citizen in general, like for example, I note that, uh, <laughs> uh, remember Marty Pfeiffer got the Stratcom um, communications guidance. <laughs> All right. and, and at least for me, that was really insightful. And so actually, I learned a lot about the function of government from how they thought about Twitter. So maybe that's, I'll rephrase the question. What did you learn about the function of government from how they look at Twitter? Um, so this isn't particularly profound, but my guess would be that if you were trying to lobby government and you were trying to get a policy change, social media is not the way that it's going to happen for you. Um, unless you're like a black swan um, tweeter who has millions of followers and you can start some sort of massive campaign, in which case, you know, social media is absolutely integral to campaigning, um, as we've seen with multiple efforts. And so if it's as part of a campaign, then you can use social media, but that mainly is, it's not so much the message on social media that speaks, it's the number of your followers. Um, and so I would say if what you're trying to do is to get government attention, do whatever you have to do to get the largest number of followers um, and make it part of a bigger effort. Um, I mean, what, I don't think we found anything particularly saying that government, like, I don't think government policy is going to change because of the tweet. Um, I, I think that's actually a really interesting answer, though, because um, I observe that with a not all that high follower account, once I passed a certain threshold, um, it really became a, an account where I was broadcasting out much more than taking information in. And I would imagine that that's, that's much, that's also true for, for quite a bit of other aspects in government. So. Oh, you what? just went quiet, Jeffrey. Oh, it's back. Never mind. I, I would just add the other thing is that, um, and you two can also, are also kind of evidence of this. And it's that by having that kind of a higher profile on social media compared to others in the community also often means that traditional media sources might be more likely to go to you. So I feel like if there's ever a nuclear story in the New York Times, either Jeffrey Lewis or Vipin Narang is being quoted. And so that's not necessarily a way to like lobby or try to get government change, um, but it is a way to like get your issue more into the general media and the press. Um, but yeah, in but you know, Jeffrey, to your more specific question, what did we learn about how governments tweet or how governments kind of work? Uh, it's that they don't work very well and it's incredibly messy. Um, so, you know, we looked into a lot of different US government agencies to see who had tweeting policies and who didn't. And it was, com it was all over the shops. So, you know, like there was the Stratcom one, as you said, that um, Martin found, but there were other, you know, there were some other organizations that didn't seem to really have a policy. And that was, again, that was really evident during the US-Iran crisis where Pompeo is tweeting one thing, the White House is tweeting something else, and the Department of Defense is tweeting something quite different, actually. Um, and so, but then there are other branches of government, um, like I know some, um, like I, I think the State Department actually does a pretty good job of usually they only tweet something that has been in a pre-approved and coordinated document. So you don't have this totally rogue tweeting, they will just copy and paste something from a Pompeo speech that you know went through the interagency process, for example. Um, but that's just one department out of many uh, where, and that's why, you know, it, it does seem a bit soft to say, oh, they need an interagency best practices guide. That's actually a really big ask based on what we saw. Well, we're coming up on the, um, I guess for you, it's 5.30 mark. Um, I'm having to translate from California time here. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we've got, we've got about four minutes left. And I, I wonder if, um, starting with Vipin and, and then going to Heather, if each of you want to just give us a minute or two um, of, of what you, you know, if you, if you are at a cocktail party and someone asks you about this, you know, what is the kind of most meaningful thing that you have taken from looking at these at these questions, and and we'll start with we'll start with Vipin because I want to give Heather the last word on on her own panel. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the the velocity of information uh, and noise out there is something that you know we really haven't had to contend with. Um, you know, both as as consumers, just on an everyday the news cycle basis. Forget nuclear crises, like just the the. You know the the smartphone era 
with Twitter, it's not 24 seven, it's now 24 by seven by 60 by 60. It, these are like, they're updates every second and the sheer velocity of information makes it very difficult, I think, to separate signal from noise and the tendency to, you know, overreact to everything because of that uh, is, is something that is concerning because I think we're, one problem with the sheer velocity is we're, we're just so keyed up and amped up for everything that uh, I think the baseline now is both governments and publics overreact to everything uh, because you can and you do and it's simple and it's um, you know a matter of seconds and then you know you get sucked into it because then it's the instant gratification well who's replying how many retweets how many this that right and so the platform itself incentivizes overreaction right if you notice the tweets that get ridiculous numbers of retweets in um, on COVID for example right it's not um, it's not the virologists, some of them do, but like the ones that are posting these papers are not the ones getting 3000 retweets. It's the, it's the person that says, oh my God, you know, it's aerosolized, we're all gonna die, immunity is gonna fall, right? It's the hysterical responses that gain traction and the platform incentivizes that. And I worry that, that the, the velocity and the incentive structure of Twitter, um, and maybe I'll take back my uh, re regrettable agnostic comment. I actually think it's built for <laughs> it's 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 built for over amplification and overreaction. Yeah, uh, we've we've gone from uh, we've gone from never read the comments to it's all comments. Exactly. Heather, you want to you want to bring us home? Sure. Um, so if I was at a cocktail party, I'd feel bad mm. for whoever was stuck was stuck with me to talk talk to an academic. We just keep um, drinking. What's what? Is <laughs> um, so the first thing I would say, based so the first observation is based on the research, which is this is not just a Trump problem. And Alexi and I got asked that a lot, which was, oh, so you're just researching Trump. But from the work that I've been doing with Vipin, seeing how Modi tweets, for example, um, Putin doesn't tweet, he doesn't own a computer, but like this isn't just a Trump thing. And whenever you know, Trump leaves office, this problem isn't going away. So I think anyone who says, oh, it's just Trump, it's not a big deal, um, is making a massive mistake. And then the other thing would just be like personal observation from like my, per my use of Twitter is, has, I found it, it's been very difficult to accept. You are never gonna change somebody's mind over Twitter. And I've gotten into some very heated um, debates, particularly with some disarmament activists because I keep thinking, if I can just phrase it a different way, they'll understand. And it's like, you, you could have 280,000 characters and you might just not get anywhere. Um, and so kind of taking that step back, I think is really important for a kind of more um, productive, for more productive Twitter conversations, but also for, for one's uh, sanity. Um, and just thanks everyone again. Yeah, well, so Vipin, thank you for your excellent comments and, and, and Heather, thank you for not just your comments, but uh, a really thought provoking oh, monograph that scared the pants off of me. <laughs> I'm glad it had that, re that effect on you, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and thank you all for joining us. Um, it's been fun. Bye. Thanks all.